All right. So now for a little bit of new Python, this is what I'm going to call the last of the basic Python lectures. And then um, I don't know when, but we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about where I want to go, either today or tomorrow. Um, uh, but um, we'll talk about how you create your own modules, and what, how they work. So um, we'll talk about the motivation for why you want to create modules rather than putting everything you're doing into one big file. Um, how you code modules, a little bit about how you go about self-documenting code. Um, this is going to be the talk of a future um, PIG, Python Interest Group meeting, um, where I'm going to hope to learn something more that I don't know. Um, what was the date on that? Is June 22nd sounds right. Okay, so we'll go back to our Wednesdays. Okay, um, and uh, how to incorporate test code into a module, um, what Python actually does with your modules, and a little bit about it and some examples and style in Python in, in this. Okay, so why do this? Well, um, when you write software, if you write one big gigantic program, which is of course the way we used to do it back in the days when we um, had to take our boxes of computer cards down to the computer center, and read them in, then um, you end up um, having a lot of code that no one really can follow, least of all you, six months after you've written it. If you write your code in little pieces, then you have a good chance of doing a few things, one of which is that you can reuse your own code. Second thing you can do is if you've got a small piece of code, you can test it well, potentially. And it's largely readable when you've got something that just does one relatively straightforward thing. And it's all together. Um, but that's not all. Um, it's also good practice, for example, um, something you'll hear about a lot about from Claude. If you're writing a program that does graphics, it has a graphical user interface, and it does some math, to separate those things. Why? Because you might want to use the math somewhere without using the graphics or the graphical user interface. You might decide, gee, I really want to get these nifty features of this other graphical display program, so let's rewrite the graphical display module, and then my software will work in some new way, some new platform. Um, it also becomes much easier to find out what's going on when you've got clear interfaces to what is what variables are being used where. So that's this code encapsulation stuff. Um, and it really, really does help with debugging. Okay, so how do you do it? Well, this is sort of an outline of what you will put in a module. First thing you do is um, you should describe what is it that that module does. You do it with a doc string, which is a string that can be single quotes, double quotes, if it's going to span lines, it's most convenient to do with the triple quotes. And so doc document what your, what your thing does. Then put the imports that you're going to use up at the top. It's not required that they're there, as long as they're defined before they're used. But if you put them there, it makes it much easier for somebody who's looking at your code to figure out what packages are being used. Then define the global variables that you're going to use inside your module. Okay, Again, you'll initialize them. You'll see them all there. It'll help make it easy for you to see this is what I'm using in my code. And then you start defining routines. And you'll notice um, right here I define a routine and then I define what, the doc what that routine does, what its arguments are, what it returns, and then finally, we'll talk about this in a second. So, okay, so we've talked about that. Um, doc string, place the imports. There's even some suggestions on breaking down the imports into um, stuff that's built into Python, distributed packages, and then locally written code. You don't have to do that, but it's a good idea. Define, comment, local variables, and then finally, define your routines. 
All right. Um, so, okay, yeah, I just emphasized all that stuff that I should have mentioned um, as I was using all these a fancy animations. Okay. So then finally, what's this thing down here where I've got the name underscore underscore name equals? Um, okay, well actually if we do that, just to give you an example, um, here I've got a really short, do short useless um, module, uh, but I'll use it as an example. I can run something called PyDoc on it and it prints out a nice little bit of documentation pulling out the important bits in terms of documentation um, so you can learn a little bit about what it does. Now um, Debbie's going to talk about um, next month using a um, self-documenting procedure in software called Sphinx which does an even nicer job than this if you format this information with certain tags. Is that a fair statement, Debbie? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm really excited about learning about that. Not real excited about going back and changing some of my stuff to update it to match Sphinx, but I think it's going to be worth the effort. Okay. So, what about this thing down here? What does that do? Well, um, this statement here is a little bit of gobbledygook, which um, underscore underscore name underscore underscore is set by the Python interpreter to be the name of the routine that's being imported or if it's the main routine itself it'll be set to be underscore underscore main underscore underscore. Anything that you put inside this block here will get run if this file is being run as in Python, if you load that into the Python interpreter. But it won't get run if you import the package. So this is a great place to either put test code or example code. And it's not required, but it's really nice because you can look at somebody's package and you can learn, you can, you can run it on, some something, on, on something simple and see how it works. Or you can test to make sure that it continues to work properly. All right, so um, the ideal is that you write code that's self-testing so that you know if something breaks when you take it to a different computer or Python gets updated or something like that. And the ideal is to think about it, your, what you've written in your module in such a way so that you can test every routine across all possible if statements and branches and stuff like that inside your routine so that you really test it under all possible conditions. If it tests under all the conditions you can think of, it's probably going to work fine when you use it in your real software, in your, in your real program. Okay. Um, I just said that. Okay. Um, and even if you don't do that, and you just provide a little bit of test code, it still provides a good example of how to use it. Okay. So let's see. Um, so I've told you that. Let's see. I've told you all this. Is this a duplicate slide maybe? All right. So how does Python use modules? When Python encounters an import statement, which we've seen before, the module is located by searching the sys.path list for a directory that contains that module. Um, if it doesn't find it, Python will throw an exception, which you can either handle or not handle. Um, once it finds the module, it looks first, at, it looks to see is there a PYC file or a .py file. And it looks to see whichever one of these two is newer. Okay? The PYC file is an interpreted version of the .py file. And if it can read that file, it saves a almost infinitesimal little bit of time by not having to interpret, ag interpret it again. Um, if the Python um, interpreter sees that there's an out-of-date .pyc file and it has the right permissions and enough space, it'll overwrite the old .pyc file with a new .pyc file. But if it can't, it won't and you'll never know.
um what's the it it if you i guess what it comes down to is if you have um a um module and it gets used a lot and you've um and and you're going to in, and you're going to import it 100,000 times then maybe you want that extra little bit of speed up <coughs> and it does give you a little bit but i've never tried to measure how much what i can say is that i don't see it when I take the largest Python files that I've got, um, I can't tell the difference whether I'm reading from a .py or .pyc. But I'm there. No doubt there is some savings. And for what it's worth, which I still find it pretty incredible, the .pyc files are machine independent. So you can take your .pyc file from Windows and run it on Linux on a or a Mac on a PowerPoint chip, and it will run just fine. So it's 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 not compiled, but it's interpreted. Okay, and we talked about this. So it's going to run the first time you import the um, .py or .pyc file. It's going to run the code that's inside. It's not going to run anything that's in this block here that we just described. Okay. It'll only do this once. If you import that file again any time later in your that same Python run, it will not run the code again. It will just establish a pointer to what's already been defined. Okay. You then access the functions in your module the same way you would to any other Python module that you read in. It's going to be named module.function. And if you define any variables inside your module, you'll access them with module.variable name. And you can read or write to those variables. What if you're debugging or something like that and you actually want to force Python to reread that code that you, that you, um, that you pulled in with import? you can force that with a function called reload. Something you'll probably only use when you're doing code development, but it can be done. Okay, and the thing that you'll, if you use the import module as mod, you'll use this name mod here for the reload, not the name that corresponded to the actual file name. One common mistake that people will make um, I shouldn't say common, but it's common for me, <laughs> is to type um, import module.py. You never do that. If you want to read in um, testjunk.py, you say import testjunk. Okay. All right. What if you have a module that's referenced in a module? Well, you can use hierarchical naming. So here I've got um, a file called mod1.py and the first thing it does is it imports mod2 and here's mod2 and for what it's worth both of these things have global variables var1 dot var1 in mod1 is equal to 1 var2 in mod2 is equal to 2 well I can import if I import mod1 mod1 contains mod2 so the variable that's defined here is mod1.mod2.variable.var. And as I said before, I can change it. So let's take a look at a little bit of code that does this. So I import mod1, I change var in mod2, and then just for fun, I import mod2, okay, and then I and I'll print out mod2.var and mod1.var. So um, what's going to actually happen? Well, um, let's take a look at. Oops, I thought I. What actually happens is I have two different variables here. I have mod1.var and I have mod2.var. They're completely different variables, um, which I can refer to in two different ways. I can refer to them as mod1.mod2.var or mod2.var since I've done the import here. But this will print out 3 because that's what I set it to there. And this will print out 
one, because I never ch touch it. So the take home message is that variables are um, global within your module, but they are local to the module. Okay? In the sense that um, they're not, they're, they're in different namespaces. That's really the right term to put them in. Okay? So, again, and if you think about this, I'm writing, I'm, I'm writing um, mod 1, Debbie's writing mod 2. We both decide to use some variable poorly named as var. Um, we don't have to worry about each of us clobbering each other one, what we're doing. You know, the my changes are going to affect her or vice versa because everything's encapsulated until we get to the upper level where we're referring things by their namespace with these prefixes of, of mod 1 or mod 2, like we've done here. And also, I want you to get used to the idea that even though I've imp I, I'm saying import it here, it's already been imported once, and the variable mod2.var has been defined for us at that point because it was done inside this import. Sure, Dennis. Yep. If I just had import mod two, if I didn't, no, no, I didn't. Right, no, I could not do. I could not. It, it does not know what mod two is without this statement. But I could also do one other thing. I could say mod two equals mod one dot mod two. That would work too. Okay, but this statement here defines mod two for us. This statement here defines mod1 and mod1.mod2 for us. More questions? Yeah. Um, if you did reload, that would force it to rerun this code. I'm sorry, this code right here, this mod2.py code, and that would reset var to mod2. 2 to 2, two not mod2. Two. var to would 2 2. <coughs> okay. All right. A little bit about style. Okay. Um, for some tasks, you really do need these global variables. But where you can, don't use, where, where they're not necessary, don't use them. And here's why. Okay. Here's two different things. I've written, I showed you a factorial routine. Here I um, define the input for my factorial routine and then I call it. Here I specify the input for my factorial routine as an argument. Okay. Which one is going to be easier to maintain? Well, this one is much easier to follow than this one is. I might end up, if I start editing my code, sticking in half a dozen lines between this. I might accidentally define this thing twice and not be aware that it's the second time that I'm using it. This is much cleaner. Okay. Also, it's a little bit cleaner to use functions to set global variables than otherwise. Um, let's say I have in my calc a bunch of different routines and I want to have a bunch of statements in all of the routines that print out extra information for debugging. Then I might want to have a, and by default, I might set that variable debug level to be zero, but if I turn it to one, I get more output, and if I turn it to two, maybe even more output than that, and so on. Well, I could just simply set the variable. There's nothing wrong with that. But it'll be a little bit easier to track down my code if I ever need to f do something if I use a routine to set that because then I'll know everywhere it got changed. It's much easier to find that down the road. Much easier if you decide you want to have set you want to do multiple things when you change the debug level to add more things into that routine. So I encourage you to use global variables. They're really useful, but where you can parameters are better and in general, it's cleaner to write routines rather than set global variables just like that. But um, that's one of those rules that's made to be broken. Okay. Um, so let me give you 
a little bit of examples and then we'll move on. So um, I haven't checked to see this is up there yet, but I've put a file called plotnotebook.py, or I just asked Debbie to put a plot file called plotnotebook.py um, that really simplifies doing some graphics. And I'll talk more about um, how this actually works next time, but what it does is that when you do an import of plotnotebook.py, it immediately does initialization. There's stuff that you'll need to do in order to do that. It does it once, always, as soon as it's imported. It provides a function, make plot window, that makes a plot window for you. And then it has another, and, 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 and then it, and then it um, once we get a plot window, we get some functions back we can do stuff with. And then finally, the last thing we'll do is we'll call show plots. So this gives you an example of some code. I think that this file, not counting the test code, is like 130 lines of code or something like that. It's really pretty short. And it gives you an idea of how one can write a relatively short, clean, and very useful um, uh, um, module, for in this case, for doing plotting. And I'll show you in probably le in hopefully less than an hour how we actually use this and how to understand it. Um, some other sample modules you might want to look at. These are much bigger ones, but um, in the GSAS 2 program that Bob Andriel, and with a little bit of help from me, is working on, um, there are two modules that I've gone through and tried to make pretty. Um, one is does a bunch of lattice calculations, collection of a large number of, of functions. Another one does space group calculations. And um, I don't like to tell people to you look at my code as being examples of really good code, because it's not, but it's adequate code. And one nice thing about it that I've done with this is I have put tests in because um, this one in particular calls a Fortran program. And I worry a little bit about Fortran working the same with different compilers and different operating systems and all this other stuff. So um, there are 230 space groups. This runs the code on all 230 space groups. It actually runs it on more than 230 space groups because for those of you who understand what this means, it looks in non-standard settings since the GSAS code will handle that. And it does two things. It checks that the results of this from, th from, from running these routines give you the same results you got when I ran it on, on the test input and also te tests it against another code. It's completely independent so that I have some independent verification that there aren't any bugs showing up. So Based on that, I have a reasonably reasonably high feeling of confidence that this works properly because it gives me the right results as measured against somebody else. So unless they've made the same mistakes that Bob, Bob did, actually Alan Larson did, or, um, and, 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 and also more comprehensively, that it gave me the last results I got, la the results I got last time I did the tests, I can feel reasonably confident. And I can run those tests by just simply pulling in this file and saying Python space gsas to space group dot py, and it'll print come back and it'll print OK if it passes all the tests. So it's real easy to test it when I when I pull it in. Okay. Also recommend um, Google has an internal style guide for writing Python routines. It's nice to see how the pros do it. So that's there for you. Okay. So in summary. Create modules. It's a really good idea. It's a really, really good idea. Okay. Um, when you find yourself working on a large Python file and it's gotten to, I don't know where your limit should be, 500 lines, 2,000 lines, 250 lines, something in that range, ask yourself, is this doing a lot of different things or is it really just doing one thing? If you think about it, and it's starting to do more than one thing, maybe it's a good time to break it up into two modules. Um, uh, and if you do that and you write small modules, 
you will find that you're using stuff, you know, but you're producing stuff that you and other people will profit from because it'll be easy to say, oh, I solved that problem. Use this. And all you need to do is to read the documentation and you don't have to worry about how it works. Yeah, go ahead. Right, absolutely. Claude's point was that um, it makes sense to call to 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 have hierarchical modules in a sense. You may have, you know, when something starts getting big and complicated, you may say, well, gee, in order to handle this task, I need this overall level, but then I need sub modules that handle maybe the database part of this, and another w another module that handles the date manipulations and things like that. So it may very well make sense to break your module up into um, in, into multiple modules because it's then everything's easier to follow. Was that was that was that your point? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um so a little bit of homework. Um um here's some code that creates something called dummy mod. Um what happens when this code is invoked by calling python on it? And what happens when this code is imported? Um, you can do it in your head, or you can actually get Python to do the hard work. Um, and then we'll create a second module called dummy mod one, and which imports dummy mod. And what happens when this is invoked directly? And what happens when you run this code here? So that gives you something to do in your in your copious free time. Okay. Um, questions on um, Python modules? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. No, when you, you cannot, the question was, can you pass arguments to a module? And the answer is no. All you can do with a module is you can import, you can import as, providing another, an alternate name for a module. You can do from module import specific things. Now, I didn't talk about that because I don't want you to use it, but um, when you do that, it's going to run the whole module just the same way it did before, but then it's going to erase everything except for the specific things you asked for, or at least it's going to prevent you from accessing them. 